Hello, this is Michelle from Physioactive Indonesia, bringing to you our Singapore Surgeon Insight Series. Today, joining us is Dr. Kanan Kalia Perumal, Specialist in Orthopedic Surgery from the Specialist Orthopedic Center, Singapore. How are you, doctor? I'm fine, Michelle. Hope you're keeping well in Jakarta. We're doing well. Thank you, doctor. Let's start with a brief introduction. Can you tell us about your qualifications and experiences? Sure. Um, I'm an orthopedic specialist. I've been uh, practicing for the past 15 years. I'm in private practice in Singapore. Um, I specialize in, uh, I basically subspecialize in lower limb surgery, which includes the and I deal with adult and pediatric problems related to the lower limbs. Okay. Thank you, doctor. Today, we will be addressing the flat foot and its malalignment, a common issue known to affect one in five Asians. Doctor, can you explain what is flat foot? Is it something someone is born with? Is it hereditary? Please give us a bit of an explanation on this. Sure. Flat foot basically means flatness of the arch of the foot. You may hear people saying that, oh, I was told I've got flat foot. Oh, I was told I've got a high arch foot. Uh, I've got heel pain. I've got some difficulty finding shoes. So basically, the concept of flat feet is when you have a broad foot or a splayed foot. And when you stand, the arch or the inner part of the foot really collapses and touches the floor. And that's a very simple, basic understanding of flat foot. But what we do need to understand is the concept of flat foot and its related problems in adults and in children. So if you take two, these two populations separately, the approach and understanding is different. In the child, if you detect or if you pick up flat foot, the parents may notice that the child walks funny, has got a bit of limb length discrepancy, one leg may be shorter than the other, or he has, the child may have a curved spine, or the child may have a shoulder malalignment or a drooping. So these are all signs in a child. Or the child may complain that he or she feels tired after engaging in running or activity or sports, or they have difficulty finding the right type of shoes for the child, for school or for, or for sports. In the adult, flat foot presents a little bit differently. Well, the adult may present with feet pain, aching pain, or a deformity, but sometimes the important aspects of flat feet in adult are bunion pain, or presentation with toe deformities, or heel pain, plantar fasciitis, Achilles pain, Achilles tendon, or calf tightness or calf numbness. And sometimes patients also present with knee issues, pain on the inside of the knee or pain in the front of the knee because of the alignment of their heel or their knee in relation to the flat foot that they have. So it's basically understanding the underlying presentation and examining accurately and doing the right investigations. And then we can approach the concept of flat foot, which is why sometimes it's a little bit difficult to explain. It takes time to make the patients and the families understand what the underlying problem is. Okay, so based on my understanding here is that there is nothing good about having flat feet, right? Okay, the incidence of flat foot in East Asia, it's about 35 to 40%. That means one in three people have a flat foot deformity. Now, whether they are symptomatic or not really depends on what problems they have and whether this is attributable to flat foot. So people may ask why, why, uh, I mean, why, am, why do I have flat foot? Um, is it a problem? I mean, is it normal to have flat foot? Well, flat foot in itself is normal, just like how there are people who are tall and people who are short. There are people who have um, different colored hair. So flat foot is just a shape of the foot. But the problem comes in when they have symptoms related to this flat feet. There is a very strong family history with flat feet. 
The second is that in East Asia, we are not a shoe wearing population. So from a very young age, lots of children, they go barefoot. And in the Asianic population, the ligaments, the tissues are very loose and very stretchable. So when you move around, we don't wear winter shoes, we don't wear uh, footwear, we don't bring our kids to wear covered shoes, most of them barefoot, run, you know, wearing sandals and flip-flops. So the arch starts to collapse at an early age. And there is a strong genetic predisposition as well to flat foot. So to, to see whether you know, having a flat foot is a, is a bad thing or not really depends on the problems that you may face if you have some of these issues which flat foot can lead to. Okay, so based on the symptoms that you had described earlier that uh, tells us that flat foot is not good or requires medical attention, what is the process or can we maybe explain to the viewers at what point should they come to the orthopedic uh, specialist and what would be the steps or the process of investigation before they should decide if surgery is the way to go? Yes, that's a good question because patients want to know, um, well, is it a problem? I've, I was told I got flat foot, my foot looks a bit different, or I've got issues, is it related to the flat foot? So before we can go to that, we need to understand what is the anatomy or what is the problem with flat foot? You see, there is a very important tendon called the posterior tibial tendon. TTT tendon on the inside of the foot. And most times it is this tendon that fails to hold the arch in a curved manner. So if this inside tendon starts to fail, the arch starts to collapse over time. And from a childhood state to an adult condition, in an adult, it is known as an adult acquired flat foot deformity, or otherwise known as AFFD. In the, uh, in the child, this tendon is still developing. It, the ligaments are still getting some strength. So if your arch of the child is very, very loose or very supple, and this tendon does not have the ability to develop in the right way, and if you ignore at a young age, this same child in adulthood can develop, can develop problems with flat foot. So having understood this concept of how a flat foot problem evolves, then we can look at how this needs to be investigated. Okay? So very simply, over 90% of the time, the problem can be diagnosed with having a proper history and examining the patient. We have to check the calf, suppleness, we have to examine the foot, we've got to examine the alignment of the child or the adult, and we have most of the time we arrive at what the problem is. If we need to investigate further, we need to get weight-bearing x-rays of the feet, and I also do sometimes a scanogram. Scanogram is basically an x-ray taken from the hip, knee, and ankle, and it tells me the whole alignment of the lower limb and the measurements. And with the scanogram, sometimes you can actually pick up limb length problems. For all we know, the child is actually walking in a funny way because the tibia or the femur is shorter or relatively the other is longer. And, and in some instances, we also go on to get x-rays of the spine because if you have a pelvic or a hip malalignment from a flat foot, the spine tends to curve. And many parents notice that, you know, I have noticed that the spine is not straight and my, my kid has some back issues or even the adults have some back issues. It's actually due, due to this malalignment. So in summary, physical examination and history going on to very targeted radiological investigations. And sometimes in special cases in adults, we get an MRI of the ankle because we want to look at the condition of this tendon which I just mentioned, the PT tendon, which may be damaged in quite severe flat foot. Okay, so if the patient now uh, needs to uh, decide what to do, besides, let's start with besides surgery, 
what can, especially for children, can they maybe get special shoes with insoles or what is the first step before um, deciding to do a surgery? Because that's always the last resort for any patient. Absolutely. Absolutely. Surgery should always be the last resort. And if we have to do a surgery, it always has to be an adjunct in the process of recovery. It's never an end process. Mm -hmm. So the important question to address is, should you see a specialist and how do you recognize the symptoms? And the second question is, once you've seen the specialist and you know there's an issue with flat foot and all these associated problems, what can we do? The good thing to note is that 80-90% of cases of flat foot in a child or an adult don't require surgery. Most of the time, they need a custom-made orthotic for children to balance their gait and reshape the foot so that the foot can actually develop in the correct manner. And once they reach adulthood and they've completed their growth phase, the child need not be dependent on orthotics. Now, there are some children where the deformity of the flat foot is quite severe or their arch is really low. And we, when we do see some of these kids, it's difficult for them to even walk or even put on a soccer boots or even run in, a, in the track. Now, these kids will find an orthotic very hard to tolerate. So we need to go on to a brace. A brace also corrects the ankle. It's a little bit higher. And for these kids, they need special shoes. So there are things we can do to try and correct because the kid is still growing. Right. The tissue is still supple. Mm -hmm. Now, there are small, there's a small number of children who actually need surgery. And the surgery can range from a very simple procedure to a more complicated procedure. The simplest procedure that you can do for children and 90, 95% of the time, that's all the children need. I mean, even if they do need surgery, is putting a small stent into the arch of the foot to raise up the arch. So imagine putting or having an external insole or a correction, mm -hmm. but you put the orthotic or the stent, a small, basically the stent is basically about two centimeters and it's round, looks like a, like a small screw into the joint to raise up the arch. And once that is done, the child can tolerate an insult if he, if he ever needs one. They can play sports, run, walk. The gait is corrected. Some of the children say they feel taller because suddenly from a flat arch, the arch suddenly goes up. You know, they, they move around better. So that's about 90% of the children just need that stent surgery. The remaining 10% would need other procedures. And this, we are talking about the more complicated pediatric flat feet. Okay, so, so before we get to that, doctor, for the simple procedure, what is the downtime? Let's let's talk about the, the downtime, the recovery phase before we get into the more complicated procedure, please. Yes, definitely. So if the child requires, or rather if the child has, has tried all the conservative measures like the insoles, the physiotherapy, the shoe wear modification, but still can't tolerate the insole or wants to be insole free, just wants to wear different shoes, doesn't want to be on insoles, barefoot and so on. This stent procedure is done as a day surgery. It takes only 30 minutes to do the procedure. It's done under sedation. And the child or the, or the patient, the adult, goes home the same day. They walk. I give the patients a special shoes. They walk on it and they do some physiotherapy. In two weeks, the wound has healed. They can shower, they can go about the activities. And by the end of the month, they're actually back to doing sports. And the incision to put the stent is one and a half centimeters on the outer part of the ankle. You make a small incision and put the stent in under radiological guidance. Mm -hmm. So you know the correct position and it takes a lot of experience to put the stent of the correct size and, the in, and, and in the correct position. So once that is done, in two weeks, three weeks time, we do a check x-ray. Everything is good. The child continues activities. Okay. Okay. And what about a complicated procedure, doctor? 
So if a little bit more needs to be done, and these are usually the adult population, a combination of procedures may need to be done. You may need to have a release of the calf muscle. You may need the stand procedure as well, or you may actually need to do adjunct procedures with plates and screws. And these are conditions where we're talking about where we need to actually correct a bad deformity. Now, this for these cases, the recovery can make, it may take anywhere between four to six weeks. And in the first one to two weeks, we advise the patient or the child not to put weight. So we give them a special boot, like a moon boot or an air cast boot to wear, and then they can actually weight bear. So all in all, flat foot surgery is not complicated. That's the take home message. Lots of things has evolved in terms of the incision. We, we do a lot of things through minimally invasive incisions and the equipment has improved so much over the, you know, the time that all these implants are easily put in and easily acceptable by the patients. Okay, so what about the case of having the bunion? Or uh, is there a surgery to help that? Because that really uh, affects the walking of a person. Exactly. So bunion is one of those consequences, I would say, of having a flat foot. A patient can have a bunion without a flat foot. That's fine as well. That's usually a genetic component to that. And there are patients who have a bunion which is associated with the flat foot. And bunion surgery has evolved leaps and bounds over the course of 50 years, I would say. People have been doing operations for bunions for 50 over years. And from very complex surgeries where the patient can't even walk for one month to using wires, having infection rates, we have evolved to doing minimally invasive surgery with small two centimeter or two and a half centimeter incisions using implants where the patient walks two hours, three hours after surgery. And we have evolved to such a stage where we can safely tell the patients that the recurrence rate following a bunion surgery is near 0%. That's what is important of a bunion uh, uh, reconstruction. Low recurrence, easy acceptability by the patient, and easy mobility post-surgery. Okay. So for our Indonesian patients that say plan to go and get themselves checked and if they have to do, a, let's go with the complicated surgery, how should they plan their travel? Are they looking to stay for two weeks or, or, or can they do the surgery and immediately come home first and come back? Can you give us a bit more detail so they are aware of the planning? doctor? Certainly. I can share with you the experience that, that I've had with, with the Indonesian patients who, who have had come for their surgeries. Of course, now with the situation, uh, they're not able to travel. But before that, I had a fair, fair amount of uh, you know, patients who travel for their surgeries to Singapore to see me. What most of them do is that they come and they stay about one to two days. After the surgery, I'm able to see the patient in the clinic, do a dressing and so on. And they're able to go back home to Jakarta or to Medan or to any of the universities mm -hmm. they're from. Um, and I do follow up with them through video calls or they, I, have, I have given them access to, to local doctors and GPs mm -hmm. where they can go for dressing change as well. So a lot of patients who come to Singapore to have surgeries done in my clinic and with me, they have a very good follow up. And that's very important in terms of physio, in terms of wound care, and if they have any issues, we are always available. And way before all this Zoom came in with all this teleconsulting and everything, yeah. I was doing it for over three years with uh, WhatsApp and Skype. Mm -hmm. And even my name card had my Skype ID. So my patients could reach me and communicate with me. And that's how we have to do it because uh, we are in the business of doing surgeries. And lots of times patients need a lot of guidance along the way, especially in my subspeciality, which is lower limb surgery. Mm -hmm. Lower limb surgery, knee, ankle, foot, it affects their walking, affects their gait. So every little thing, we have to guide them along the way. So it is actually quite uh, acceptable to the patients. And I've not had any issues with the patients uh, planning their visit here. Uh, some, of course, stay two weeks, three weeks. They have an apartment here or 
they they do a lot of shopping here and sitting in a wheelchair. <laughs> so, you know, really depends, really depends. Yeah, and they come to the clinic, you know, on and off, to, 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 to you know, to chat with the team or to have a coffee. So there are many different types of patients. Okay, but so do really they have, on the patient yeah, so do they have to come back after maybe two weeks or a um, certain amount of time to do a follow-up checkup? Yes. So there are two types of follow-up that the patients are comfortable with. Most of them feel comfortable coming back to Singapore to do the x-rays here and see me for the post-op visit. So two weeks, some of them come at end of one month. Uh, but I do, do like to follow them up and I do like to see them at least a few times in the first two to three months okay. for surgery, be it a flat foot surgery, be it a bunion surgery, be it a knee replacement or ACL surgery, it doesn't matter. And there are other group of patients who actually are here for the technical expertise and they're very comfortable with following up in, in their hometown with the doctor or with their specialist or with their, or with their physiotherapist. Actually, the physiotherapists play a very important role in actually managing and informing me of the patient's outcomes and, 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 and they go as far as to do some wound care as well. So um, I'm actually very happy to have them come back to Singapore you know, so that I can follow them up. But I'm also very comfortable if they are very comfortable following up from where they are for two to two, you know, for two to three months. So I see that the key key point here is that you have communication, constant communication with the patient and wh whoever is handling all the care for the patient post surgery, be it that it's in Singapore or in Jakarta or in Indonesia, Absolutely. I should say. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So they're always reachable. I mean, me, my staff, we're always reachable mm -hmm. via WhatsApp. I think that's the most popular mode of communication in yes. Indonesia and in Singapore. Yes, yes, that's right. So, doctor, is there any particular um, uh, complication that may occur that uh, our viewers should know of if they decide to do a surgery? Yes, definitely. Now, general complications always apply to any surgery in orthopedics. Um, I always do an informed consent with the patient. The top of that is wound care and wound infection. We don't want any issues with wound infection or deep infection. So I'm very, very particular about dressing, about you know keeping the wound clean and constant follow-up. Sometimes I'll ask the patient to send me photos. Please let me know. And I will have to advise them, hey, you know, don't please, please don't put your foot on a newspaper because... Uh, they feel that they don't want to walk on the floor. They, you know, they put some newspapers and all that, you know, because the floor is dirty or sandy. So a lot of things we really have to advise them along the way. So wound care, wound infection is a risk. We need, but if we take precautions and you know, and we know what to expect, it's not really a big issue. Number two, in lower limb surgery, which I subspecialize in and and do swelling. Swelling can lead to a lot of numbness of the foot. Or wound, uh, or you know, wound issues. So we always let the patients know to elevate the leg, make sure that we, you know, we give them advice on icing of the joints and so on. Um, the third complication or the third uh, risk factor that we need to know about is the general fitness of the patient. So prior to a surgery, in patients uh, who have medical history, we do a thorough cardiac evaluation. We check the heart, ECG. We do all the blood tests and everything. And sometimes we do pick up things which may need to be corrected, to prevent any you know, issues with the general state of the patient. Um, other than that, uh, specific complications which are related to, to the surgery itself, which would include implant surgery. We need to make sure the implants don't fail. We got to guide them on with, by taking serial x-rays to make sure the implants are all in the correct position. Uh, there's always a risk of implant failure. So we need to counsel the patients accordingly. Um, yeah, so basically the surgical counseling and informed consent is very targeted on the type of surgery that the patient goes for. Okay. Again, I, I sense here that communication is very important for you, doctor. It's, it is the key to establishing a patient-doctor relationship mm -hmm. and having a successful outcome post-surgery. So, doctor, one more question is, uh, do you feel in your experience from what you have uh, handled or dealt with the patients who are more aged, do they recover? Do they have a slower recovery uh, time uh, or do they feel more pain or anything more 
do the when they do the surgery? Okay, in my honest opinion, some of the patients who are more than 60 years old or 65 years old have done a lot better for the same surgery in patients who are like 24, 25 years old. Let's take, for example, the bunion surgery. Sometimes I correct the bunion in a 60-year-old lady or I correct the bunion in a 24-year-old lady. But you'll be surprised how fast the recovery is in a 60-year-old. And I'm talking about very positive recovery because they are very committed to their recovery. They're very committed to the management. Whereas maybe someone who's 24 years old, they feel they like to take on this sick role where they say, no, I can't do it. You know, uh, it's a bit too painful for me. No, I want to go slow. I want to take it easy. And then the recovery is a little bit slow. So age is never a consideration when it comes to the physio and the rehabilitative potential of a patient. Age comes into a factor when you have soft tissue quality and how successful the surgery is. So if I perform the surgery of bunion correction in a young patient, for example, their soft tissue recovery, wound healing is a lot faster. And that's a fact because they are younger, the blood supply is better, the collagen integrity of, this, of the, the skin is better, as opposed to someone who's 60, 65 years old. There's less fat, the collagen is of, less, you know, of a lesser quality, the healing is a little bit slower. So my primary consideration is actually the patient's physiological and psychological uh, recovery mode, which I always tell them, look, you know, this surgery, just put your full recovery mode in this. You play your part and I play my part. And, and then the journey is a lot smoother. Okay. Okay. And do you have any interesting experience you'd like to share with us about maybe one of your surgeries? Oh, on a patient recovery? Yes, please. Uh, okay. Please. There have been many instances, actually, my, I think my own, I mean, my main uh, positive experience of, of actually operating on patients from overseas, and I've got, I've got a lot of patients from Indonesia, are actually the, it's actually the strong, uh, strong word of mouth and the strong recommendations and the, and the good word that they put in uh, based on the experience here. So that is, that's been the most positive experience for me, actually. Uh, if I were to think of specific uh, instances and so on, um, is uh, basically a case I did last year, I think, um, a young girl who, who actually required a knee surgery. She was the captain of one of the international school's uh, basketball team. Um, she was told that she doesn't need surgery, just do physiotherapy. Uh, and the mom actually uh, you know, got my contact from one of her friends and came to Singapore. They made two visits and the second visit, you know, she said, no, you know what, we're gonna stay here, get the surgery done. Surgery was done, and the surgery was very straightforward. But the what? But the effect of the surgery on this child was manifold. She was more confident. She went back to sport. She regained her captaincy. Mm -hmm. It was captaincy yeah. was taken away from her because she was injured. Right. So she regained her captaincy. Um, she performed very well. It did a lot for her confidence. And the mom is forever grateful. She has sent a lot of her friends and other, other patients over to me. Uh, but that's not so important. What's important is that this the surgery, which actually a very straight, straightforward surgery, worked for her because she was given the right information. Uh, she had the confidence and she had a good post-surgical rehabilitation. Even though she was not in Singapore, but she was back in Jakarta. So all that, that tells me is, again, good communication and always to be there for the patient whenever they may have very simple questions. It was a very simple surgery, but, you know, but it was a reconstruction. It was ACL. But, uh, but the confidence that the, that the parents and the, and the child had in doing a surgery and going back was that we gave the full support for this patient all the way through the recovery phase. Okay, well, this is great information. Thank you so much, doctor. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Michelle. I do appreciate uh, your time as well. Uh, hope you guys stay safe and all the best to you guys. Okay, so I'll just give a little bit of information for our viewers. If you are interested with speaking with Dr. Kanan, you can either visit their website 
at www.specialistortho.com.sg or send a WhatsApp at plus six five nine six two eight six nine three three to schedule an appointment. If you're planning to get your surgery in Singapore and live in Jakarta, you can start your physiotherapy at Physioactive Singapore and continue your rehabilitation program in Physioactive Indonesia. On behalf of our entire team at Physioactive Indonesia, we want to thank you for tuning in and we look forward to bringing you more top quality content from leading industry surgeons. Thank you.